Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I have such an equipping episode for you. And the reason I say that is because just having this conversation with my friend, Seth Gruber, who is a warrior in the pro-life cause, uh, was just so equipping for me personally. So I can't wait to bring you some of the information and things we talked about. We talked about the dark history of Planned Parenthood and its founder, Margaret Sanger, and how that is connected with eugenics and racism and all sorts of evils that also connect to the culture of death we see today, where we are transitioning children, where we have abortion on demand and all sorts of moral evils that are affecting the whole person, which is really rooted. And this was one of the highlights for me when Seth talked about how this is really rooted in the ancient heresy of Gnosticism. And I wrote about Gnosticism in my first book, Another Gospel, that chronicled my journey of going through my faith crisis and what were my deepest, darkest moments and bringing the reader into that and then tracing that through history and looking at progressive Christianity from a biblical worldview. But one of the things I definitely encountered in that journey was the ancient heresy of Gnosticism, which uh, generally speaking held the view that matter, physical matter, was, was sort of of evil or in some cases didn't even really exist. And therefore, all that really matters is the soul or what, what's inside of you. And that is really that disconnection of the body and the soul is where we get so much of our culture of death today. So I thought that was a really big highlight for me. Uh, Seth also connected uh, even uh, Margaret Sanger's ideas to inspiring a lot of the policy that was written in Nazi Germany and how much um, the ideas that came out of what her work was producing inspired Adolf. Hitler. Um, so many great things to talk about. Uh, we talked about uh, the current policy and how Christians can approach these things. So I, I hope this is very equipping for you. If you missed last week's episode with Joni Hammond and her daughter, Lauren Johnston, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that one and listen to this one. It's sort of a two-part series that I pray will be very equipping for you as we think about not just abortion, but this entire culture of death and where this is all coming from and how how far back the history goes. This just didn't happen in a vacuum. It just didn't happen all of a sudden. This has been a long and very intentional um, ideological invasion, I guess you could call it. So definitely go back and hear that because you'll hear uh, Joni's story, who is another warrior in the pro-life movement. She's a friend of mine who runs a pro-life pregnancy center in Tucson. And she also holds retreats for women who have uh, had abortions and um, leads them through the steps of repentance and healing. And it's just a beautiful ministry that she has. So I think these would be two episodes that would be really good to listen to together. I also want to let you know that next week, I'm going to be doing a live stream on YouTube. So we don't tend to do that that often anymore, but we're going to do it next week. So at 3 p.m. Central, that's 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, I'm going to be live on YouTube taking your questions. So, you know, lots of you write in through the website with your questions. I'm going to be picking a couple of those, but this is your chance. This is your opportunity to ask me absolutely anything anything. And we will do that for about an hour next week. And then, of course, that will go out onto the audio platform forms after I'm finished on YouTube. So maybe if you typically listen on the audio platforms, maybe on Monday or Tuesday, uh, you might be compelled to join us on Sunday at 3 p.m. Central for the live stream and ask your question and invite your friends to ask their questions as well. All right, here is Seth Gruber. Well, Seth, great to have you on the show. Uh, I've looked forward to this for a long time. For anybody who's unfamiliar with you and your ministry, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Thanks, Elisa. Um, you're 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 rare, unfortunately, in the American church today. Um, very few people that we even used to respect are willing to say what needs to be said. Yeah. Um, when, frankly, um, the sodomites um, are at our front door, and we don't speak in order to preserve our sacred rights and our way of life and our comfort, uh, but we do it to be faithful. We mm. do it because we've been told to, and we do it because ideas have consequences, actually, and bad ideas have a lot of victims. And when you're not willing to hedge off bad ideas um, from whence they come, they poison the water hole. Um, and so for too long, most believers in the West, and certainly in America, Lisa, in my opinion, um, to quote my pastor, Rob McCoy, wait downstream to pick up human heartache that they yeah. helped create through their political apathy upstream. Yeah. 
Mm. You know, things happen gradually, then suddenly, Elisa, um, just like bankruptcy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so Drag Queen Story Hour, third trimester abortions, arresting pro-life sidewalk counselors, throwing them in jail, t- arresting parents who speak at school board meetings and labeling them as domestic terrorists and the greatest and most extreme threat to freedom and democracy. Um, none of these things happened suddenly, which is how it feels like. That's how yeah. we feel as Americans. Yeah. No, they happened gradually. And then the dam broke open. And mm. then it feels suddenly, but they were brewing for a long, long time. The role of the theologian, the role of the apologist, the role of the Christian world, do you think, or the role of the pastor, and I believe the role of every lay Christian is to be the sons of Issachar, the Bereans, uh, the men who understood the times, who tested all things, who understand their faith, can give reasons to it, is to be able to preach against, speak out against evil and evil ideas. Not because, like I said, well, we just want to make sure that we can keep preaching the gospel so they don't shut the doors of our churches. No, 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 no. We do it because it's the right stinking thing to do. And because we know our history that when Christians have stayed silent in the face of totalitarian, Hmm. humanist-oriented ideologies and governments, people die. Yeah, People die. And, And so I'm just grateful for you that you're willing to say what needs to be said at an hour and at a time we're saying such things might come at a cost because Vody yeah. Bauckham was very right. The fault lines are dang big right now, aren't they? Mm, the they fault sure lines are. are massive. And every time I wake up, I feel like someone else fell into the chasm. And I'm <laughs> like, what happened to these men and women that I yeah. thought I knew I could trust to, yeah. to, 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 to rightly handle the word of truth, to preach the full counsel of God? They're falling left and right. Anyways, yeah. so that's why I appreciate you. That's why I'm on your show. That's why we're going to have you on my show. And I launched what is now the fastest growing pro-life organization in America, the White Rose Resistance, uh, right after the overturning of Roe versus Wade, June of 2022. We're less than two years old. And God has been faithful. And I feel like we're living in a time when evil, uh, the spirit of the age, Mm -hmm. um, has overplayed his hand. And so common sense individuals, believers and not believers, by the way, are are going, holy moly, Um, I can't make sense of what's happening in this country anymore, Um, absent a spiritual and religious framework. And this is what this is the statement and acknowledgement, Elisa, that got Tucker Carlson fired from Fox. Sorry, allegedly fired from Fox. He gave a talk at the Heritage Foundation annual fundraiser dinner the evening before he was fired in a speech that was posted. And he said, I don't know how to make sense of what's happening in America anymore outside of a theological perspective. When the, when the Department of Energy comes out and says, you know how you can help the economy get an abortion? Mm. He goes, well, you know what? That's like an Aztec principle, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when people say, hey, I have a great idea. Let's sexually mutilate the next generation. Um, wh- when their purpose is just to destroy and burn things down, Tucker said, I don't know how to understand this anymore outside of a religious, theological, spiritual lens. And I think that's where a lot of Americans are at right now. And our organization, I think, was providentially situated by God to be able to provide a lot of the clarity and answers to the mama bears and papa bears speaking at school board meetings, to the pro-life mm. sidewalk counselors, to the mostly silent pastors who are starting to be awakened to their duty in the political realm to say, how did all of this happen? And so one of my favorite lines is from Chesterton. He says, happy is he who knows not only the causes of things, but who has not lost touch with their beginnings. Mm. Um, in other words, the sons of Issachar. <laughs> it says that they were men who understood the times, and so they knew what Israel ought to do. Elisa, that's the only thing we know about the sons of Issachar. So they understood the times. So they knew what the people of God ought to do. Well, what's the flip side of that? If you don't understand the times you live in and you don't know how to make sense of it, you, you won't know what mm. the people of God ought to do. So we provide those answers to wake up the American church to fulfill her spiritual obligation mm-hmm. of ending the greatest genocide in human history, abortion, the killing of babies, but we connect it to the entire culture of death because those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And those who murder the unborn will one day murder you too. The longer you tolerate the religion of secular progressivism and their sacrament of abortion. 
Mm. So welcome to the Elisa Childers Show. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Okay. So, so much to unpack here. What I really want to accomplish in our episode together is helping people understand not only what time it is, but exactly what you've just described. How did we get to the, what time it is right now? And as my audience knows, I've been talking a lot about the the fact that we are now in the negative world, right? We were in the positive world. We're Culture was generally okay with Christian principles up until about 1993 or 94, from 93, 94 to about the mid-2000s, kind of neutral. That's when the Tim Keller third way seemed to be, you know, working a little bit, but even Tim Keller getting right. canceled at the end of that. And now we're in the negative world, and and we have to be absolutely crystal clear, not only in what we say about what's going on, and, and I love that you're connecting all these things together as a part of the culture of death, because what a lot of Christians, I think, are unaware of is that, you know, it's not just abortion. The The same sort of impetus behind abortion is mm -hmm. what is causing people to medically transition minors. It's like you mentioned, all those things listed together so eloquently. And I want to help our audience today understand how we got here. And I want to start well, you can you can start wherever you want to, but I definitely want you to comment on Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood because we have really not covered that a whole lot on this mm -hmm. podcast. And I really want to cover it because I know that, you know, there have been people who have done some really great work getting this out into the open. But then, of course, you know, you have the Planned Parenthood apologists who deny certain things and reframe and spin the narrative and then say, oh, well, we're, sure. we'll take her name off of this and that. So maybe, you know, if you want to go earlier than that, go wherever you want to go. But um, I'd love to just figure out how did we get here in America mm -hmm. to the place where we are literally it's like, I can't even believe what I saw uh, just online this morning, that they're asking questions like, can a two-year-old actually, you know, know that they want to transition to the to another gender or something like this? And I'm just going, That's right. I mean, I know what's going on. You know what's going on. Help, help us connect those dots. My family's absolute favorite meat company is Good Ranchers. Every single month, we get our grass-fed beef, our better-than-organic chicken, all of this meat, by the way, which has no antibiotics or hormones ever. This is delivered right to our door on dry ice, ready to be put in the freezer. And this gives me such peace of mind because then I don't have to stress about what I'm going to make for dinner. It's just sitting there waiting for me. But I also know that it's the absolute highest quality. And here's what else I love about Good Ranchers is that this is one 100% American meat. This is American-born, raised, and harvested meat. So you know that when you buy from GoodRanchers.com, you're supporting American farms and getting the absolute highest quality meat possible. But that's not all. Every box supports local farms and U.S. veterans. So that gives me great peace of mind. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you go to the grocery store and you go to buy your meat, the prices are going up. But we don't really know the, the quality of the products because uh, the vast majority of the meat that's in the grocery store is coming from overseas, from countries that might not have the highest quality standards or standards of transparency. But I love that Good Ranchers wants people to feel peace of mind about their transparent products. But they also want you to be proud of the company and the mission that they support. So they also donate a portion of the proceeds to paralyzed veterans of America. Well, they've got a great deal going on right now. If you subscribe right now, you're going to get $100 off. And that's going to be spread out over the course of the first three months. But you're also going to get free American Wagyu burgers for a year and free two-day shipping. So this is a no-brainer. Try Good Ranchers today. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ELISA for that $100 off. And for American Wagyu burgers, free for a year plus two-day free shipping. Again, go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ELISA. That's GoodRanchers.com. American meat delivered. Yeah, I mean, you know, Schaefer used to talk about how Christians tend to deal with ideologies, philosophies, and culture in bits and pieces, rather than seeing how the whole thing goes together. And I mean, Schaefer and and her his protege and one of my favorites, Nancy Piercy, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, have been so helpful to the body of Christ in helping explain the breadth, depth, and beauty of a Christian worldview. 
Um, but but when we deal with bits and pieces, like, well, let's take off the the abortion box and let's open that and let's talk about how that happened and 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 why would people believe that? And okay, let's put the abortion shell, let's put the abortion box back on the shelf at least. Oh, right, let's take out our LGBTQ element PIA, my name is Legion box every June mm-hmm. and let's open that. And and why do they want to diddle the kids? And why does the UN want to reduce the age of consent and say it's 10 or 11 years old, even though it not, might not be recognized legally as such? And and you know, kids should be able to consent to sex because they're sexual beings and okay well let's put that box back and let's take out our critical race theory box and you know let's talk about critical theory and let's talk about the frankfurt school and herbert marcuse uh, and antonio gramsci and the strategy of the robes and okay and then let's put that box back on the shelf and we're not effective um when we deal with culture and ideologies like that Mm. Uh, every religion has a dominant sort of um philosophy or ideology that helps all of its um, seemingly disparate pieces connect. Um, yeah. and, and, and our Christian worldview is the most broad and deep worldview that there is that actually has answers to all of these questions. And so too many, too many Christians try to master uh, topics by themselves, like abortion, the trans stuff, uh, the parental rights stuff, the sexual curriculum stuff, uh, but there is a there is a worldview behind these things, um, and and we ne- we need to be able to actually to speak to that if we're to help the next generation not be <laughs> ideologically screwed, um, mm. and 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 sometimes that actually literally leads to being screwed. I, I apologize mm. for the crassness, but I mean we, we're seeing pedophilia, yeah. um, sexual pornography addiction. Um, and child rape, like we have never seen before in America. Uh, that's a whole nother box that we could open. But but we actually have to understand how all this stuff kind of goes together. I mean, for example, Margaret Sanger, um, literally at the end of her life, was teaching her teenage daughter um, uh, about sexual petting um, and and sex and to- told her granddaughter, okay, okay, this is the founder of the largest, best funded, and most profitable 501c3 in human history, Planned Parenthood. Sanger, in her later years, was teaching her teenage granddaughter that I, she said, I think sex about three to four times a day is a good number. Um, Sanger had more affairs than I could recount on this podcast. And these are things you're not going to learn about um, unless you really do your research. There has been a very intentional campaign, Elisa, to curate the life and legacy of Margaret Sanger. You can actually watch it if you, if you are really... Um, if you're really a researcher and you read all these materials, you can see some of the more uncomfortable truths and sides of her life begin to disappear from l- some of the later coverage and writings by Planned Parenthood and some of her biographers. And no one's, by the way, covered this better than Dr. George Grant, a mentor and advisor to me and my new project and book coming out this summer. And he wrote the, the bombshell book on Planned Parenthood in 1988 called Grand Illusions, The Legacy of Planned Parenthood. And no one would debate him. No one at Planned Parenthood wow. would debate him on the topic of his book because they could not. Um, and so why, why bring up Sanger at all, right? Um, well, sure, Seth's a pro-life speaker, so you, you, you want to be the expert on Planned Parenthood. Yeah, sure, but, n- but no, actually. We're talking about maybe the most successful, let, let me be very clear, the most successful Marxist, sexual, revolutionary, progressive activist of the last 115 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and and not, don't take my word for it. Uh, here's one of her many lovers. Um, ever heard of the name H.G. Wells? Um, he wrote a book called War of the Worlds. Yeah. <laughs> one of Sanger's many lovers, Elisa. Uh, he said that, you know, Alexander the Great, he changed a few boundaries and killed a few men. Uh, both he and Napoleon uh, were forced into fame by circumstances outside of themselves and by currents of the time. But Margaret Sanger made currents and circumstances. When the history of our civilization is written, it will be a biological history. And Margaret Sanger Sanger will be its heroine. Wow. Um, This woman has been called the patron saint of feminism, breaking through every quote unquote glass ceiling that, uh, uh, that, that, that the sexists and chauvinists were trying to keep women down with. Um, and, and today her organization is the largest abortion provider in the world. Um, by their own celebration, they're the largest provider of the pornographic comprehensive sexuality education, Lisa, in America's public schools, that's bringing all those angry moms and dads to school board meetings. Yep. You heard me correctly, Christian. Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of the pornographic comprehensive sex ed. Hmm. And as of 2023, they are the second largest provider of cross-sex hormones and puberty blockers. Mm-hmm. Planned Parenthood Real is the quick. second largest provider of transgender drugs. Of transgender drugs, too. Wow. Drugs for minors. So, so it's like, okay, 
uh, well, I, I thought we should just talk about babies, Elisa, and Seth should just tell us not to kill babies because they're so precious. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, that's wonderful. But Planned Parenthood doesn't stay in their lane. Trans drugs for kids in the transgender industry, which includes government contracts, curriculum conferences, and the drugs, is now Planned Parenthood's fastest growing revenue stream. Okay, so there is a there is a dominant undergirding worldview that helps us understand and explain this out of control, kooky culture of death. There's many places we could start, um, but but there is a, there is a name to this false religion. It's called Gnosticism or Gnostic dualism. This belief that that the sort of the physical world, right, like is not real. It can't be trusted. It's it's the result of a, of a, the creation of an evil demigod. Um, that's that's ignorant of the one true g- good God. I mean, th- th- Paul in Colossians has to preach against Gnosticism, right? There's a reason why um, John says, um, if you want to test the spirits, Elisa, ask them, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the Gnostic belief at the time was that the fallen physical world was evil. It couldn't be trusted. It didn't give us any clues to our real identity. And so there became this obsession with the inward self, the soul. Today, the trans movement tries to talk about the soul when they use words like my authentic self, mm-hmm. my, my real identity, right? Ever heard the phrase born in the wrong body? It's yeah. like, what are they saying there? They're saying that I am not my body. My, my body yeah. is this, this shell and vessel that the real me resides in, but I can liberate the real self from the bondage of biology. Well, it's the same underlying worldview that drives abortion, Elisa. Let's think about it like this. Okay, the real person is metaphysical. This is what the Gnostics believe. Let me let me be very clear if you're listening to this, Christian. The transgender movement and religion is a movement of a false religion called Gnosticism that says, I am not my body, and the real me is my inward identity. So, so that my body's kind of like a Corvette that me, the driver or real person, steps into. But if that's the case, then why not take your your vessel to to a body shop and give it a makeover so mm-hmm. that the outside feels more like the inside? Exactly. And here we are at the front door of transgenderism. So if the real person is metaphysical, Elisa, and not physical, and so this vessel is like, hey, woo, we love the Elisa Children's Podcast. I, well, you didn't just hear Seth clap. That's not Seth. That Those are just weird phalanges of a physical vessel. But the real me is invisible because it's a metaphysical soul inside this fallen body. Really weird and kooky. Guess what? It's the same religion that drives abortion. Because if the real person is metaphysical, then the real person is the is the ident- is the mind, right? You think of uh, re- like Rene Descartes, like I think, therefore I am, right? And we get this idea that the that the real person is a found in the mind alone. And so until the mind um, has self awareness, consciousness, and desires then there is no person there yet. And so when I abort a baby in the womb, I don't kill a human being. I just dissect a body mm-hmm. because, says the pro-choicer, Elisa, the, the, the real person is not there yet. Because, and this is why Peter Singer, the, the, one of the architects of the culture of death, by the way, in, in the 20th and 21st century in Australia, mm-hmm. that old fart in Australia who, who defends killing babies through one years old, Oops, sorry. No, you didn't hear YouTube. Just pause there, Christian. Right. Uh, one years old outside of the womb is because he's consistent. And he actually says, I'm right, Elisa. He says, yeah, there is no personhood qualifications at the third trimester, but neither is there right after birth, meaning self-awareness, consciousness, and desires. And so if the, if the third trimester baby doesn't have that and the infant doesn't have that, then both of them are disqualified from the community of persons. Both of them don't have rights. Yeah. So, so this same Gnostic religion belief drives both the killing of babies and the transgender movement today. But it also was the predominant false religion behind the entire sexual revolution of which Margaret Sanger was its patron heroine and saint. Yeah. Because if I am not my body, then the material world is just at the, at, at the is like clay in the potter's hands yeah, yeah. to be molded to bring me the most pleasure. Mm-hmm. If my real self is a metaphysical, invisible soul, and this body is just this fleshy substance that I get to use or utilize however I want, then the 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 sexual revolution starts to make a lot of sense, Elisa. Yeah, yeah. If it feels good, do it. Mm-hmm. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And no one lived that false religion, and no one 
uh, applied that false religion to our culture in a more significant, impactful, and damaging way than Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, whose sordid history we can get into together for the next 30 minutes if you'd like to. But if we're to understand how this culture was created, we need to be like the sons of Issachar again and mm -hmm. understand how it was created so that we can preach the truth mm -hmm. and offer the Christian alternative of, of, of what our bodies were for and yeah. how we were intended to live. Not because we're shoving our religion down your throat, but because we want you to live in accordance with the Creator's design. One of my favorite things to do every morning is to make myself a fresh cup of coffee, go out on my back patio and read my Bible, pray, just get ready for the day. And one of the things I love about my morning ritual is seven weeks coffee, because not only is this just the highest quality coffee you can buy that is low acid, mold free, pesticide free, it's also direct trade, which is better than fair trade. In fact, seven weeks coffee pays their workers over 300% more than the standards for fair trade require. But that's not all. Seven Weeks Coffee is called Seven Weeks because they are unapologetically pro-life. And their name comes from their pro-life ethic. In fact, at seven weeks, the baby is about the size of a coffee bean, and that's when the heartbeat is first detectable. But not only that, but every purchase of Seven Weeks Coffee, they give 10% to pro-life resource pregnancy centers all across the, con the country. And that means they have raised and donated over $400,000 to pro-life groups, and these are primarily pregnancy centers. So I love Seven Weeks Coffee. They support and partner with over 850 pro-life organizations. I would love for you to give Seven Weeks Coffee a try. They're a great partner of this podcast. And one of the ways that you can support this podcast, if you love this podcast, is to buy Seven Weeks Coffee. And you're going to get an additional 15% off of every order when you subscribe. They have what's called the Heartbeat Club, where you can have your beans delivered fresh every single month. I get my espresso beans from Seven Weeks Coffee every single month. So give it a try. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com. Use my code ALISA for 15% off every order when you subscribe. Again, that's sevenweekscoffee.com. Use my code, Elisa. This is so good. Okay, I want to unpack some of this, and then I do want to continue with Margaret Sanger a little bit because I want people to understand the person who literally is behind what we see manifesting in so much of our culture today. Um, but I'm so glad you brought up Gnosticism. And we've talked about that some on this podcast. But um, for everyone listening to us, this is why this is so important to understand. Um, I mean, Gnosticism is a tangly beast, right? There was different sects that believed slightly different things. But ultimately, it was this idea that the physical or material world was evil. In fact, um, if you read St. Augustine's Confessions, you'll see that he was a part of a at least Gnostic ish sect called the Manichaeans. And the Manichaeans. Mani Manichaeism, yeah, that's right. Manichaeism, yeah, Manichaeism. Yeah. And they had this view that uh, this similar Gnostic view about the physical world, which is what led Augustine to, like, with all of his, um, before this is before he was a Christian, with all of his intellectual yep. and spiritual energy and effort, pursue God and think about mm. theology and think about God, but yet live with a concubine for, I think it was like 11 <laughs> years, you know, and even I think he fathered a, a, a child with her. And yet he was able to so separate what his body was doing was just sort of like, mm -hmm. well, that's just, like you said, it's just this kind of like um, Corvette yeah, that I get to use. And then uh, really all that matters is the spiritual stuff. And, and Christians really fall into this sometimes. Like mm -hmm. I've said this on the podcast before, there is a phrase that goes around and it's sometimes attributed to C.S. Lewis, although he did not say it. But it's the, the statement, I am a soul, I have a body. And right. um, one of the reasons I love Thomas Aquinas is because his, you know, his realism really helped bring this together for a lot of Christian mm. thinkers that really what makes you human is not yep. just your soul. It's that you are embodied. You are That's you right. are body and soul. Now, mm. there could be times when that is they are separated from one another, like at, at death. But at, after the resurrection, I mean, you will be embodied forever right. in the new heaven and new earth. So we need to start thinking that way as and, Christians. And the Bible teaches this, Elisa. And so yes. like, because because this is a Christian podcast to, to equip the body of Christ in America, believers, let me just add to that, then we'll get back into Sanger. But like, guys, the Bible talks to this. Like it's given us all we need for life and godliness. And 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 if you're a pastor listening to this, man, like I, I if you're not preaching and speaking to these issues, 
dude, wake up, man. (laughs) Honestly, find your chest again, pastor. Like, I'm 32 years old, Elisa, and I've been speaking on the issue of abortion since I was 18 years old. I was raised in the pro-life movement. I've been trying to wake up pastors for decades. I have never, ever in the last three years seen as much um, either either, uh, philosophical devastation wrought on this generation or as much hunger and curiosity for answers, mm, mm-hmm. for answers than I have in the last three years. And I'm only 32. I'm a, I'm a the kid. I'm 1991. All right. I'm a kid of the nineties, early two mm-hmm. thousands. Like, and, and I'm like, where are the pastors yeah. who will preach the full counsel of God? So let me just like, like, l- let me, let me encourage and exhort the cowardly and spur on the curious to, to remind you that like, you can preach the full counsel of God on these issues. Listen, we find this interesting Hebrew parallelism that Nancy Piercy talks about um, in the Psalms and the Proverbs. It says things like, when I refuse to repent of my sin, my bones wasted away. There's this beautiful parallelism between your physical body and your soul. When I refuse to repent of my sin. Well, Elisa, that's a metaphysical act, right? Right. Like, I can't see you repent of your sins. I can see you hit the knee, hit, hit your knees on the floor. But but I don't know whether that repentance is true or not. That's a metaphysical, invisible act of you repenting of your sins. When I refused to repent of my sins, my bones wasted mm. away. I groaned. I hurt. Physically, I had pain when I kept my sin a secret, when I refused to repent. It's linking the metaphysical with the physical. And that you see, you see Jesus when he rises again in a perfected state, Pastor. I'm giving you talking points for your sermon to apply it to transgenderism right now. Listen up. When he rises in a perfected state, he still has the holes in his hands. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus, don't you understand the religion of Gnosticism? Jesus, you got it all wrong. If you're in a perfected state as the God man, you would have no flaws. (laughs) And yet he's got holes in his hands Mm -hmm. as if to say we are both body and soul. Both things matter. And scientifically, we see this as well. There's a hormone called oxytocin um, that um, women often release when they nurse their babies. That's right. Um, but it's also released during sex. It's actually been called mm-hmm. the trust or bonding hormone. Yeah, the love um, hormone. I've heard it called. The, yeah, too. the love hormone. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and so, literally, there's there's a sense of trust that is scientifically and therefore metaphysically created through a physical act. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you you nursing your baby, physical act, physical creates a metaphysical sense of trust. So we see this scientifically, we see this in the life of Jesus, and we see this in the Hebrew parallelism throughout the scriptures. And there's other verses as well, by the way. We are both body and soul. The technical theological term for this is hylomorphism. Um, We are hylomorphic human beings, both body and soul. Both things matter. God declared the physical world good. And he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So we have to understand that this is God's intention. (laughs) He declared that the the world he made good. And yes, he's going to renew it, but it doesn't give us the opportunity or excuse to abdicate and Mm -hmm. say, well, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. It's all going to burn anyways. No, you're you're to improve where you go. Not, not, Not because of some sort of like weird, um, you know, uh, Christian, um, uh, like duty to just improve people's lives. This is not like, uh, we're not doing weird psychotherapy, psychobabble. Like, no, 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 no. It's that when the gospel goes out, things should improve yeah, because yeah. God cares about nature and he cares about the physical world. And so anyways, from a theological perspective, we have all we need. God's been clear on these on these topics. And so for Christians to understand what we're really just seeing is not a progressive revolution, at least we're seeing a renaissance. It's a regressive mm. revolution mm-hmm. back to ideologies and religions far more ancient than any of us here. And every time they've been adopted and applied in a culture, they've caused chaos. Mm. Mm. One of the most common questions I'm asked when I speak at women's conferences all over this country is what is a good curriculum to use for our homeschool? And the number one curriculum that I always recommend is Foundation Worldview. We went through their uh, comparative worldview curriculum a couple of years ago with my son in our homeschool, and it was so beneficial. He learned the definition of truth, the source of truth. He learned about other religions and how they compare to Christianity and which one actually reflects what is true. And Foundation Worldview is coming 
coming out with a brand new curriculum called God's Good Design, and this is for ages four and up. Maybe you as a Christian parent feel a little intimidated to talk to your kids about God's design for identity, gender, sexuality, marriage, and family. There's a lot going on in our culture. There's a lot of information being brought into our kids from all over our culture, and maybe you feel a bit intimidated to broach those topics. Well, let God's Good Design curriculum help you. It's 30 video-based lessons, easy to implement. You just have to print the activity sheet and press play. And there's multiple activities per lesson that will engage children's minds and their bodies with biblical truth. So they're going to cover topics such as image bearing, gender, love, friendship, marriage, family, sin, transgenderism, abuse, pornography, homosexuality, divorce, and redemption. So they're going to cover a lot of topics, and you will be able to do this with your kids. So kids are going to walk away with a biblical understanding of what God's design is and why we should follow it. Also, sensitive topics are approached gently and biblically, age appropriately, helping children grasp the truth without becoming really overwhelmed by everything. So check it out. Go to Foundation worldview.com. Check out their God's Good Design curriculum. Again, that's foundationworldview.com, God's Good Design. Good stuff. Okay, let's let's go back to Margaret Sanger here because, um, you know, there is some debate over, you know, did she really say this? Did she really say that? Was she really a racist? Was she not? What's your opinion on all of that stuff? Because, you know, one of the things we know is that there's a disproportionate amount of Planned Parenthood clinics in areas that are more financially depressed and things like mm-hmm. that. And so talk about that a, a little bit, if you would, just kind of to, cl- to clear the air for us. Give us what are the facts about her as it would relate to her being a racist and to her, um, uh, you know, all of these these kind of ideologies behind what she she essentially started with Planned Parenthood. Yeah, Sanger is is hard to put into a box because she was many things. Um, she was a eugenicist, which means that yeah. it crossed over into racism. I'll define eugenics in a second. She was a Marxist. Um, she was a communist. Um, she was a Gnostic. Um, and she was one of the most successful sexual revolutionaries and liberators um, of the 20th century. She said things like, um, through sex, mankind may attain that great spiritual illumination, which will transform the world and light up the only path to an earthly paradise. So mm-hmm. for her, sex was a way back into Eden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, she and, sounds like the serpent. And, and is that not what we've been trying to do ever since? Um, whether it was Babel, um, or whether it's the sexual revolution today, we want to get back into Eden, but we want to do it on our own terms. Yeah. Um, through sex, mankind may attain that great spiritual illumination, which will transform the world and light up the only path to an earthly paradise. That's that. that I and by the way, I have a, yes, I can cite and reference all of these to prove you, to you that these are things she said. And I have a book and movie coming out this summer, guys, called the 1916 Project, not the 1619 Project, the 1916 Project that will explain all these answers for you. But she was many, many things, and she was probably um, the most successful uh, leftist revolutionary. Mm -hmm. whose um, impact on today's crazy culture of death is greater than any of the other revolutionaries since the year 1900, Mm -hmm. probably. Um, And and so so that's why in 2020, Planned Parenthood has to take her name off the building in Mm. in New York City. That's why they have to finally call her a racist because of the pressure of BLM. That's why they're now distancing themselves from her. That's why they stopped giving the Margaret Sanger Award, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. which, um, Hillary Clinton got, Nancy Pelosi got, um, Kamala Harris has been vying for the award for some time, but they won't even give it to her that they stopped doing this because they mm. were no longer able to justify this woman's legacy, which begs the question, doesn't it, Lisa, which, well, then who the heck was this woman? Um, she, she was raised by a very bitter, um, atheist father, um, and a Catholic mother, um, Michael Higgins. And, um, she had 10 siblings and she began to be obsessed with this idea um, that Christianity and Catholicism is forcing women into involuntary servitude called motherhood. Mm. And the way to liberate women is to give them the option and choice as to when uh, and if they will have children. Um, she said things like this. And, and so you'll hear some pro-lifers today, Elisa, and pro-choicers say that Sanger did not defend abortion. One of her biographers, actually, um, 
oh, I've got his book over there. His name just slipped my mind. Um, said that she did not defend abortion. And yet I could show you lines where she said things like women have to be able to choose whether they want to have children. I can show you a line from her book, Family Limitation, uh, in 1960, in a little booklet pamphlet that I, I just bought a copy of. You can't hardly find them anymore, where she said, um, as we know, abortion is sometimes a moral option. Um, and so she, she, she was very clear about her pro-abortion tendencies very, very early on. Mm -hmm. uh, in her book, My Fight for Birth Control, she talks about a father that she saw as she was on a walk one day um, who had come home from work and, and their, their youngest baby um, had uh, some type of sickness and would not stop screaming and wailing. And the father couldn't handle the pressure of his screaming, wailing kid who couldn't be consoled. And so the, the book says, she says, and so out of the door and into the snow, the nuisance went. Um, and she said she felt wow. great compassion and sympathy for this father who no longer able to handle the whining and screaming of his kid through the infant into the backyard, into the snow. She said wow. she felt great compassion for this father. Some wow. of her, her pro-abortion tendencies and her disregard of nascent life was very clear in some of her earliest writings. And so whether she, whether she planned to codify and legalize abortion through point of birth or not is beside the point. The culture of death and the disregard for the dignity of human life at its earliest stages was very clear from the very beginning. But she, she didn't just get birthed accidentally out of the sexual revolution because she just wanted to provide birth control, Elisa, right, right. to poor Men who keep having kids because condoms aren't that great yet and and contraceptives are questionable and we i just want to help poor black and brown women uh plan their parenthood no elisa that was not the goal people like to to um, frame her like that like she was just a misguided turn of the century humanitarian who happened to find herself in some of the wrong circles yeah <laughs> no no, no. When you study her writing and her influences, we know who this woman was. She was a eugenicist. Eugenics was a term coined by Francis Galton. And, and basically, it's, it's the obsession with genes, right? The fit and the unfit. And so if you're listening to this and you're thinking Mao Zedong, Hitler, Mussolini, and Pol Pot, good job. Um, that's all yeah. eugenics, a believer. It's it's this belief that there are the good races and the bad races. And, and eugenics is actually more sinister and evil, Elisa. Uh, than racism. Why? Because racism just looks at like your skin color, your melanin, right? Like ethnicities. Yeah. Um, that's racism. Uh, yeah, eugenics is broader, actually. So it's more sinister than racism. It's not concerned with, oh, I just hate the Jews or I just hate blacks or I just hate white people if you're at BLM Incorporated. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's not, no. Eugenics says there are certain qualities. There are certain people with certain IQs. Um, criminal behavior or not, alcoholism. Uh, oh, how about this? Down syndrome, physical and mental disabilities. Right. Eugenicists are obsessed with getting rid of what they call the human weeds and defective stocks, what they call the morons and the misfits. Okay. And so Sanger once said this, she said, um, birth control, th by the way, she coined the term birth control. That's where that phrase comes from. She said, birth control is not contraception thoughtlessly and indiscriminately practiced. No, she said, it means the cultivation and release of the better racial elements in our society and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks. Those, you know, those human weeds, which threaten the blossoming of the finest flowers of American civilization. Yeah, I okay, mean, this the, is what the Germans did, right? Even with their yeah. own citizens, well, like thousands of children. And yeah, we're about go to for get it. to that, friend. But Keep she going. said in the in the introduction to her Negro project in 1939, yes, you heard me correctly, Christian, she called it the Negro project. In 1939, she said, here was the opening proposal. And yes, I did memorize all these things for you. She said, the mass of Negroes particularly in the South, are still breeding, breeding carelessly and disastrously, with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from that portion of the population least intelligent and fit. Wow. And, and you'll hear this language with eugenesis all the time, Elisa, okay? Fit and unfit. When you read the writings of Francis Galton, who coined the term eugenics, you'll always find th these terms, fit and unfit. You, you find it in Sanger's writings. You find it in Madison Grant's writings and Leon Whitney's writings and, and all these eugenicists. And you go, Rockefeller, 
right? The Carnegies, the Fords. These were the people financing, by the way, the eugenics movement of the 20th century, of which Sanger found herself right in the, right in the middle of, right in the center of. Uh, and, and so we, unfortunately in America, <laughs> provided the inspiration and blueprint to Hitler and his regime in the Third Reich. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, you heard that correctly. Oh, Seth, uh, Lisa, get this conspiracy theorist off your podcast. He's been watching too much Alex Jones. Okay, let me pr- let me provide some intellectual rigor, uh, lest you think I'm jesting. Um, uh, one of Sanger's best friends, they fundraised together. They wrote for each other's papers. Um, they shared office spaces. When Planned Parenthood was founded in 1921, it was called the American Birth Control League in 1921. Um, and she shared office spaces with a man named Madison Grant, the founder of the American Eugenics Society. Um, and she actually tried to merge her organization, Planned Parenthood, <laughs> with the American Eugenics Society. Wow. So if anyone ever tells you, Seth, Planned Parenthood is not eugenics about releasing the Ubermenschen and getting rid of the Untermenschen, that's that's the superhuman and the subhuman. Uh, no, no, they're not about eugenics and racism. They just want to help poor black and brown women not have too many kids so they can be a better parent to the kids they've already birthed. Uh, you can just prove that. You can disprove that by saying, why did she try to merge her organization with the mm. American Eugenics Society? She shared office spaces with them. All the board members and financiers of Planned Parenthood were almost entirely all on the board of the American Eugenics Society or were members of the American Eugenics Society. Madison Grant, who wrote a book in 1916, the first year Sanger opened the first brick and mortar birth control clinic. It was called The Passing of the Great Race, Madison Grant. Um, and his his secretary, Leon Whitney, who wrote for Sanger's publication, The Birth Control Review, it was Planned Parenthood's magazine back at the time called The Birth Control Review. And Leon Whitney wrote a piece called Selective Sterilization in Urgent Need. And he praised the, the Third Reich's pre-Holocaust race purification programs. Um, and so this is Madison Grant's assistant, Leon Whitney. Well, one day, one day, uh, Leon Whitney got a letter in the mail from a German corporal Uh, recently out of prison and rising in the German political scene, thanking Leon Whitney for his writings on eugenics. So Leon Whitney ran over and interrupted a committee meeting being led by the American Eugenics Society and his boss, Madison Grant. And he said, Madison, our writings are influencing the Germans. Wow. Uh, And Madison Grant smiled and chuckled, Elisa, and he pulled Mm. out his own letter he had received from the same German corporal recently out of prison and rising in the German political scene, calling Madison Grant's book on eugenics, The Passing of the Great Race. He called it, quote, his Bible. Wow. The man who wrote those letters was named Adolf Hitler, Wow. the chancellor of Germany, who found his blueprints for the eugenics and sterilization policies of the early Reich from the American Eugenics Society, the American Eugenics Movement, and all of Margaret Sanger's best friends. Oh, Seth, that's not connected enough. That's too distant. That doesn't prove Sanger was a racist and eugenicist. Okay, one of the founding board members of Planned Parenthood when it was established in 1921, Elisa, his name was Lothrop Stoddard. Lothrop Stoddard was a high official of the Massachusetts Ku Klux Klan. Yes, the KKK. He was one of the intellectual fathers of the early of the early KKK, Elisa. Um, he he was from Harvard. Um, ma- by the way, Madison Grant later had a, a chair of eugenics in his name at Harvard. So so you have to understand the eugenics ideology, guys, of the fit and the unfit um, was not like a, a European Germany, like right. over the pond thing. It was like vastly influential in American politics, Supreme Court justices, the Museum of Natural History and our universities. And Lothrop Stoddard was a founding board member of Planned Parenthood. Um, And he sat, he he was a board member of Planned Parenthood, Lisa, for years. And he was a high official of the KKK. He wrote a book called, and I'm not joking, The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. And then he wrote another book called um, The Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the Underman. The menace, the ooh, the menace yeah. of the underman. And you go, you go, who's okay, who's the underman, Elisa? And why are they a menace? Uh, who's the underman? Uh, black Slavs, Italians, and Jews, criminals, alcoholics, and the physically and mentally disabled. Um, and, and he and he wrote this book called The Menace of the Underman. Well, Lothrop Stoddard's book, let me, let me, let me a board member of Planned Parenthood. <laughs> okay. Lothrop Stoddard's book was translated by the Germans. Um, and they got the term Untermensch 
from the English version of Lothrop Stoddard's book. In other words, when his book was translated into German, Elisa, it was the menace of the Untermensch. In wow. German, Untermensch became the translation of the word underman by Planned Parenthood's founding board member's book and a member of the KKK saying that it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the eugenically unfit that are, the, are the, 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 the threat to civilization. So we need the revolt against civilization, the menace of the underman. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so Alfred Rosenberg, um, Adolf Hitler's chief racial theorist, appropriated the German term Untermensch from the English version of Planned Parenthood's founding board member's book, Untermensch, the title of Heinrich Himmler's famous Nazi propaganda book, and the phrase used to refer to the Jews as subhuman, Untermensch, subhuman. Guys, you just heard me correctly. The Nazis got the term sub, subhuman from Margaret Sanger's first founding board member's book, a man that she never in her entire life or career discounted, Mm. discredited, or removed from the board. So he was so well-loved by Heinrich Himmler, Adolf Hitler, Alfred Rosenberg, Fritz Sauckel, and many others, that the, the... the founding board member of Planned Parenthood, Elisa, was invited in 1939 to have a journalistic interview tour in the Third Reich. He wrote wow. about it in his book called Into the Darkness, Nazi Germany Today, published right when he got back in 1940. I have done some serious ADHD research, Elisa. <laughs> to my knowledge, Lothrop Stoddard is the only American to have had a one-on-one meeting with Adolf Hitler. Wow. After he rose to power, the founding board member of Planned Parenthood is the only American to have had a one on one meeting face to face in the Third Reich with Adolf Hitler after he rose to power. And when you read about Stoddard's description of meeting the Fuhrer in his book, Into the Darkness, Nazi Germany Today, published in 1940, it's hard not to blush. Wow. Then later, Hitler sent him a photo of the two of them taken together by one of his staff during their meeting and asked Lothrop Sauter not to publish it. Wow. That's the founding board member of Planned Parenthood, a high official of the Massachusetts KKK. So when, so when she launches the Negro Project in 1939, she's launching it at the same year and at the same time. He's heading off mm. to Hitler to interview all of the Nazis and 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 his book, his books were being used in German schools under the chancellorship of Adolf Hitler in 1939. That's why he was given such free range journalistic freedom, because the Nazis knew he was one of them. He was one of them. They trusted him. Wow. And Himmler, Himmler said that 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 um, Madison Grant's book and Lothrop Stoddard's book were and one other called um by Alfred Hoke and, and, and Binding and Hoke called uh, the release of the of the life of the uh, the release of the destruction of the life devoid of value, said that those books were the books that were used to craft the the sterilization laws uh, wow. on the books in the Third Reich. And and Hans Gunther, one of the highest ranking members of Hitler's Nazi party who won a, an award from Hitler, said that Lothrop Stoddard, Planned Parenthood's board member and Madison Grant who got the letter from Hitler calling his book his Bible, he called those two men the spiritual fathers of Nazi Germany. Wow. I could go for another hour, Christian. I hope you understand now Mm. that this culture of death was not coincidental. It was not accidental. It was due to the intentional campaign from call it the religion of humanism, the religion of neo-Malthusianism, the religion of secular progressivism, of Darwinism. Oh, by the way, Francis Galton, who coined the term eugenics, his half cousin was Charles Darwin, who took his cousin's book, The Origin of Species, and said, we need to apply this to human populations by, it, by creating the rise of the, of the superhuman and, and, and then getting rid of the unfit. And then Francis Galton became the protege of Havelock Ellis, who was Margaret Sanger's number one lover and influencer when she fled to England to avoid being arrested by breaking the obscenity laws and the Comstock laws in New York City in 1914, where she met all of the neo-Malthusians uh, when she starts sleeping and having sex with H.G. Wells, 
and have Locke Ellis, the Alfred Kinsey of England, who she oh. called the number one influence in her life. Well, Havelock oh. Ellis was mentored by Francis Galton, who coined the term eugenics, whose half cousin was Charles Darwin. Isn't it interesting how quickly, Elisa, uh, we went from the premise, man is an animal, Darwin, to yes. uh, apple doesn't fall far from the tree, to yeah. his half cousin, who says, um, well, then, therefore, we need to uh, obliterate the unfit, to his protege, Havelock Ellis, the Kinsey of England, and a really weird sexual weirdo who drove his wife insane by making her read letters of his sex experiences with Margaret Sanger in bed. So we went really quickly from the premise, man is an animal, to the strong must kill the weak, his cousin, Galton, to sexual weird chaos stuff, to his protege and disciple, Margaret Sanger, child sacrifice, 65 million lives, at least in America alone since 1973, and the most successful revolutionary leftists of the last 115 years. This culture is the intentional result of mm. false religion whose high priests were more dogmatic and faithful for their ideologies in the public square than the people of God have been mm. for pure and undefiled religion in the public square. Mm. Why won't we do for good? Yeah what the other side so unapologetically will do for evil. Well, this this is incredibly helpful and, um, I mean, sobering, of course. But, you know, now is the time. We, we are now, and we have an opportunity, and I'm talking to everybody who's watching this or listening to this. We have the opportunity to speak up, and we cannot be afraid. Amen. Because here's the thing. I mean, what's the worst that can happen at this point? is we get mm. called names, or maybe mm. you, you might even lose your job. You might um, find yourself under discipline at your work because you won't use the pronouns or whatever this, but this is mm. the time that we stand up and don't make the small compromises because they lead to That's bigger right. ones. And what we do have to understand, I love that mm. you so articulated this, is that this isn't just something that happened like accidentally or, you know, oh, I guess a bunch of hippies had sex in the 60s and now they just wanted to not have to be parents. I mean, there is an entire mm. ideology underneath this whole thing, and it is all connected and you've done such a great job helping us understand at least some of those connected connections with the time that we've had but I don't want our time to run out before I ask you a, a kind of a practical question it's a bit of a pivot mm. but it's one I want to ask you about because a lot of Christians right now are very confused about mm. how this is going to apply with how they might even think politically. And I'm not asking, you know, right now I can already feel people's like, you know, <laughs> getting all tense. We're not, we're not going to like tell you who to vote for, what can't, what, what I want to ask you to think about and what I want to ask you about um, is policy and like how should we as Christians be thinking about policy? Because there are a lot of different ideas out there. You have everything from, I, I remember Tim Keller coming on Twitter and saying something like, um, you know, I forget what it was. You probably know what it was about. Don't let abortion be the main th issue. Or what was it that he said? Do you remember? Yeah, so uh, I, I do. I have, unfortunately, I have it memorized for you. But um, okay. I, um, <laughs> I, I got in, in big hot water in, in 2020. I gave a talk at my earthly hero, Pastor Jack Hibbs Church. It was before he gave me the pulpit um, at, at 29 at the time. It was for his conference, Come Back California. And I, I gave a talk and, and I, I, I rewrote the introduction to that talk the night before, because the day before Tim Keller had posted um, something which has come to better encapsulate and represent, unfortunately, um, his entire political philosophy. Uh, it better encapsulate what's been called third wayism yeah. um, than anyone else. And by the way, what that means is like, so you'll hear something like, Jesus is neither left nor right. Yeah. Jesus is neither Republican or Democrat. Okay, sure. Of course, he's neither Republican or Democrat. He's a monarch. Uh, he's the king and he's coming yeah. back. But, but, but so Jesus is political because he's the king. Uh, but yeah. sure, he doesn't fit in like our conventional like two party system. But then from that premise, they go to one, they go to a conclusion. Elisa, that I think um, has nothing to do with the premises. <laughs> okay, I don't think that the conc the conclusion follow follows from the modus ponens uh, premises, which is yeah. which is they say therefore, um, you can completely not vote at all, or you can vote for the Democrat Party because while the Republican Party is right on maybe pro life, maybe the babies and parental rights, some of these leftists like Phil Vischer argue that the Democrat Party gets the broader seamless garment of grace. Right, that they, mm. they capture more of the 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 issues 
that are so close to our Lord's heart, they get mm. some of those issues better, like the immigrant and the poor, which by the way, I think is a total joke. I don't think they care about yeah. the immigrant and the poor whatsoever, but conversation for another time. So yeah. therefore, it's okay to vote for Democrats because their policies capture more of the issues our Lord cares about than, than the grand old party does. Or the premise is you can completely abdicate and not vote at all um, because Jesus um, is above. He calls us to a different way to engage yeah. this this sort of culture of death. I think that's um, the big and, push and, and right you, now. And you don't, too. exactly, you don't want to lose your uh, gospel capital and your gospel credibility by attaching it to a political yeah. party. And therefore, um, I've, I've heard it been said by some that voting for Trump was like trading your birthright for a bowl of porridge. And so yeah, you, yeah. you've abdicated any sort of credibility to preach the gospel in the first place. And so what he says in this post, he says, he says, the Bible tells me that abortion is a sin and a great evil, but it doesn't tell me the best way to decrease or end abortions, nor which policies are most effective. This means when it comes to voting, taking political positions and determining alliances, the Christian has liberty of conscience. Uh, Christians cannot say to other Christians, you must vote for, or you cannot vote for. Um, and, and so he, he says that therefore we have liberty of conscience when it comes to voting. That's the phrase he uses. He says, when it comes to voting, taking political positions and determining alliances, the Christian has liberty of conscience. The, the, and, and, and why are we talking about this at all, Elisa? Because Heller has sort of come to represent uh, this stand-in mm -hmm. um, or this leftward or centrist obsession in evangelicalism, that we can be crazy, super faithful to Jesus, but not get involved politically whatsoever. Centrist he, he, obsession. He, he, that's a, that's yeah. a great phrase. Centrist yeah, yeah. obsession. That yes, is, that's right. That is, we could do a whole and, episode on that. Yeah, yeah, and, and we will. Um, I'll have you on to talk about that. But, um, and, and so he came to represent what's been called third wayism. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say actually no one probably shifted the Overton window. This this phrase is going to get me in trouble with Big Eva, but I would say no one has shifted the Overton window further left in American evangelicalism than Tim Keller. Yeah. Okay. And it makes now, me what, sad. What, I agree with so you, tragic, but it, yes, it makes me yes. sad though, because he has done so much good so much good work. I still recommend his apologetics book. And I read The Reason for God. When we talk about policy, we talk about um, pro, being pro-life. Um, I've, I've heard, I heard this, this word maybe three or four months ago for the first time. And that word is abolitionist. And when you hear that in, as it was relate to abortion, you're thinking, well, yeah, I want to abolish abortion, of course, but that's actually not what it means. And I'd love to get your opinion on this because this is something I think that, um, is gaining more publicity through YouTube and social media. I even had, uh, mm -hmm. somebody ask me at the last conference I was speaking at, are you an abolitionist? And yeah. thankfully I had been looking into it. So I was able to give my answer. I'd love to know your answer. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, explain what it is, and then uh, just give a few thoughts ab about that approach to policy and to um, just pro-life activism in general. Well, I'm an abolitionist because I want to abolish abortion. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, what you're talking about, Elisa, is the divide um, within those who call themselves <laughs> anti-abortion um, of immediatism and incrementalism. Um, and that's what you're asking me. And I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, I did with Natasha Crane recently, and I have been arguing with these people and taking heat from them, Elisa, since 2015. From abolitionists or, or people that yeah. would call use that word in that way? Okay. I, I call them immediatists, um, because I don't think they get to redefine what the term abolition means. For example, don't we all say William Wilberforce was an abolitionist? Let me just yeah. give an example here. Of course, yeah. guess what? He was an incrementalist. Um, he supported legislation to refit, to refit slave ships, to reduce suffering on the passage over to Europe. Um, that's called incremental. <laughs> that's not yeah. abolishing yeah. slavery in one foul sweep. Uh, and yet, the the immediatists who call themselves abolitionists that I've been debating with, actually don't debate with them anymore because most of them are absolute jerks. Mm. Um, that's the kindest word I could use on your show to explain them who they are. Now there's some of them, there's some of them I really, really love, like um, Jason over at Operation Save America. Um, I love that guy. We've had a cigar together. He, he, he's like fully, he doesn't actually do ministry or partner with some of the other immediatists because they're 
I'm trying to find another word to communicate nice. my feelings. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're the people that you actually break fellowship with be, because mm. you know what I'm talking about. And so, because here's the things I was told by some of these guys um, back when I was like fresh out of college I, I and I was starting to speak around the country more and more. Alisa, they told me Seth doesn't want to make abortion illegal because if he does, he'll lose the speaking honorariums. Yeah. To which I wanted to say, you can go burn. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean goodness gracious, like, oh my gosh. Like, and they, they would say things like, um, you know, Scott Klusendorf doesn't want to end abortion um, because it's, uh, he won't have a job. Yeah, and I've heard like, them make claims like that on YouTube, yeah. which makes no sense at all to me. Now, now, are there people in the pro-life movement or pro-life establishment that we have reason to suspect do think that way? Yes, I think there are people in the in the broader pro-life movement or pro-life industry, um, Elisa, who who actually do not want to abolish abortion. Um, and they will often oppose some of the legislation that might abolish abortion at the state level. Uh, and so, so listen, I think there are people who are, are this has become more of a job um, than, than a calling in a ministry. Mm. But that's not me. That's not Scott. That's, that's yeah. not most of the pro-life movement. And so most, most people don't want to do work or ministry with these people anymore because they're just jerks. Um, but what they're talking about is immediatism. And it's the belief that the only true and just equitable. Uh, actually, the only the only Christian, actually, that's what makes it kind of scary, Elisa, is, is they actually say the only Christian response to abortion is to call for and support the total abolition of abortion with no incremental victories mm -hmm. or victories in the process of going towards total abolition. So let's say I'm a I'm a Republican um politician in Idaho, and I want to ban abortion. And I craft an abortion ban bill to ban it, Elisa, with penalties for the parents if they murder their kids. But I don't have the votes in state uh, Congress, in state Senate um, to get this bill passed. And I'm lobbying and I'm arguing and I'm, and I'm trying to figure out how to get the centrists in the party to, to give me the votes I need to get it to pass. And I don't have the votes. So I, as I'm biting my tongue and scratching my face off and I'm, and I'm, I'm killing myself to do this, I put in a rape and incest, uh, um, exception in the bill yeah. and I get the three more votes I need. Now abortion is virtually banned in the state of Idaho and I'm going to go after the rape and incest exception later. But I, I put in the yeah. exceptions to get the bill passed. Most of the immediatist movement, and this means free the states, um, abolish human abortion. Uh, Jeff Durbin um, mm -hmm. with um, in, in uh, Phoenix area. Uh, I forgot the name of their ministry. Um, th they would say that you need to repent. I have mm. been told by two abolitionist immediatist guys in Idaho because I spoke at a church and the pastor knew these guys and they wanted to meet with me. And I was like, I really don't want to meet with you. And yeah. sure enough, they were jerks. And, and, and they said I needed to repent, Elisa, um, for um, supporting bills that stop short of total abolition. So I told them to call my pastor, Rob McCoy of God Speak Calvary Chapel. And I told him, you need to take it up with him because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm accountable to my pastor and you need to, to ask him to put me under church discipline. Um, because if I have an unrepentant heart, um, then this has to be taken to the church to whom I, I'm, I'm accountable. And I need to be held accountable to the pastors first. And if I refuse yeah. to repent to the whole church and the pastor who had brought me out to speak was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> He's like, I don't think Seth needs to repent yeah. or be put under church discipline because he also wants to ban abortion like you. But if he can't get an abolition bill, he's going to support a frustrating <laughs> incremental victory until it, we can get to total abolition. In short, in short, Elisa, in, that's the debate. Yeah, it just seems to me, um, and I have I have not gone as deep into it as you have, but it seems to me when the subject is murder, why would you only, if you can save some lives on the way to, you know, saving all the lives, why would you not do that? Why wouldn't you support something that would at least save some lives? Um, yeah. I mean, that they seems- They argue that, 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 um, that pro-life incremental laws, this is the language they use, by the way, you can tell mm -hmm. how long I've been arguing with these people. They say that that legislation um, means that we're choosing who gets to live and who gets to die. 
To which we always said, no, the Supreme Court did that in 1973. Yeah. We're trying to save as many lives as we can. Of those lives and, as possible. And now yeah. at the state level, right? Um, because states can ban abortion now, right? They can completely ban abortion. And by the way, as a Christian, if you're listening to this, like here's the here's the beauty and, and necessity of getting political is because now your politicians, they don't have any more excuses. These weak, wimpy, and woke Republicans, Elisa, they can no longer say, oh, well, Roe v. Wade, you know, Roe v. Wade, we can't do anything. That's the law of the land. No, they can't do that anymore. You need to hold them accountable as a believer, yeah. as a pastor, to demand righteousness from the halls of power, to demand and, and let them know that they will not get reelected if they're not willing to ban abortion. And so now at the state level, we have the opportunity to ban abortion. But again, if we don't have the votes, is it better to have no protections for preborn children um, so that you can feel really pure in your conscience? <laughs> And not get your hands dirty in the business, in the difficult business of politics? Or is it better to save some lives and then come back three times more energized next session yeah. to try to ban it? Uh, and they would say that you and I, Elisa, and Scott Klusendorf, and most of the pro life movement has to repent yeah. and should be put under church discipline until we repent of supporting anything that stops short of a total abolition bill. Well, I want to thank my guest, Seth Gruber, and I want to thank you so much for listening and for watching today. If you're watching on YouTube, it helps us out so much if you subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. And if you're listening on audio platforms like Google, Apple, and Spotify, so many of you, thousands of you, have left great reviews for us, which really helps get the, uh, the message out to more people. So if you haven't done that yet, I'd love to invite you to go over and leave us a great review. That helps so much. Also helps if you share this on social media uh, or click like, leave a comment. All of that stuff helps the algorithm. So thanks so much for watching. And as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time. So pray for me and I will pray for you. No turning right or left will make it through. The road that's never It's gonna be